tests and why you should try to burn down your production environment without killing it, actually. Um, but first, my name is Sebastian. Um, I'm the chapter lead of the backend department in the, the company, the Kartenmacherei. Um, probably no one of you knows what we are doing, so a couple of words to the company. Kartenmacherei is translated to English like card makery, and we are not doing like maps and all this stuff, but we are doing real, literally, cards for wedding invitations. Um, and all emotional events. And uh, we are seven years old, we are above 100 people, we are mainly based in Germany, so we have three locations in Germany, we have in the company uh, uh, about 15 to 20 nationalities, so main language of ours is English. And we currently have five stores and several million of uh, designs and cards and ways to get your cards how you want that. But before we go into the topic, short disclaimer, everything I tell you tonight, or yeah, today, sorry, <laughs> not that late yet, um, everything I tell you today is based on our own experience. There are better ways and other ways uh, how to do some stuff. Feel free to approach <coughs> me afterwards or in the Q&A section, let's discuss there some more and better topics. Um, but everything I want to show you is based on the fact that we had to find a solution um, for the specific problem at this time. So, so much for that. So, next point. First, let's go th shortly through the ag agenda. First, I want to show you our project and the architecture of our project, uh, just for better understanding uh, why we do something like smoke tests and why we actually thought we need that. Um, then I would love to get you all on the same page what kinds of tests exist and then we go into the specific smoke tests Then I show you how we uh, get our server architecture running and how we uh, deploy the codes in order to see when it's the best time to run the smoke tests um, and last but not least questions and answers good but first let's go for the product uh, project architecture and before we start into that when I started in this company I go we had a monolith and a friend of mine just ran some random tests on one of our biggest files we have there and this number is just showing the complexity of one single file and it's the biggest file we have and we had the fun out of it um, that we tried to get there for this number a wording, so that we get their real name for this number. We found several websites and that's what we came up with. So, <laughs> come on, there's still stuff which doesn't sound real. <laughs> so, or that one, sorry. <laughs> it's, but that was the closest. I think we tried several websites um, to get their wording for this number and we ended up like three or four of the websites just said, sorry, that number is too big for us. <laughs> Good. So we said, okay, come on, we have to change there something. That's, we can't leave it like that. We are senior developers. We want to get their good shit out there and we want to get it in a nice shape so everyone understands the system if, from just reading it. So we said, okay, come on, what's, what do we have to do? So we want to have, and that came from our boss, he wants to have this view. That's how it should look like. Um, and um, with all these nice tiles, so we started something like one and a half years ago to build some build and try a few things. Uh, and after half a year, we, we finally found the perfect solution. We went for a couple of weeks, months into the wrong direction, killed it, restarted. So we came up with a, with a project, we called it Fury. So Fury is based on a t US TV series, maybe someone knows it. Um, it's from a, t from a US TV series from the 1950s, actually. It's about um, an orphan boy um, with, an, with his fastest and most reliable horse. And we said, okay, come on, we need something really fast, we need something really reliable, because we want to have that possibility to scale that wide. So we need it reliable, so that's what we came up with. 
And our idea, what we finally came up with, is we said, okay, why <laughs> should we actually serve HTML and render HTML somewhere on request? So we said, okay, come on, we won't need that. So um, we said, we put our pre-rendered HTML into a key value store, we put in a search engine next to it, and then we serve the request directly from the, KV, from the KV. So no problems on that side anymore. But somehow we said, okay, come on, somehow we have to get the values in there first. And we still need to render the HTML, but maybe not on request anymore. So we said, okay, come on, we need a backend. So in the backend, we do pretty much the main trick. And that's what I would love to show you uh, in, in this slide. Um, we call it actually collect and export. So for us, we start just collecting the information uh, from our legacy database. Then we publish, we render the HTML, and we render um, and we, we process all the search requests we want to handle here um, and publish that to these systems. And one thing we have to do as well is because we are not replacing from our legacy system all pages. So we said at the beginning we want to replace only product detail pages and category pages. So everything which is card, wish list, we don't want to worry about. We only want to have these pages fast in the first place and then worry about everything which is based on sessions, databases, some real big issues what every shop has. So we said, okay, come on, we take the, we want, still want to have the view that all these pages which are still in the legacy system, um, they should have the same header and footer. They should, at least from a header and from a footer perspective, they should look the same as any other page. So we said, okay, to have no dependency from, from the old system to the new system, we said, okay, we push the header and the footer into a KV storage for the legacy system to use. So that's, that's the only, and that's why it's red, that's the only restriction we have there that either system knows of the other one. Besides that, indifferent which system you run, you can, you can uh, um, as long as it's not the backend process, if it's just the frontend process, it's completely independent. So, but how, how's, now is the question, how does that work? How does the request work? Because we have two s different systems delivering pretty much similar code, or at least in the end, the same product. Um, so we said, okay, come on, we want to put that in place. If we get an, a request and we can handle this request, we will go to the key value and check first if that request exists. And yeah, if it exists, then we will do some extra searches. We might get to the session to tweak there a few things on the front end and uh, just ship it. So in the case of, for example, the card, the card won't be available uh, in the new system. So, okay, the new system is shipping a 404 and then the whole request goes just to the, to the old, to the legacy system. But that's so much for that to our architecture. If you want to know more about the architecture, it's an own talk, so where we go much more into detail why we actually did that, what's the reason for it, how we managed features like 100% code coverage, like um, shipping the page within 100 milliseconds, so time to first byte. We have, for example, on the home page, last week it was uh, on the home page, time to first byte, 35 milliseconds. So. If you want to know more, have a look on that website. There is the link to the talk. But now let's get all on the same page. We have that test permit. And that's what we use in our company. And our, as the first and as the ground layer, we have their unit tests. So what is a unit test? A unit test is pretty much, as the name is saying, a testing a unit. So when, these, when we have these four units, we want to test only unit one. We just have to mock the direct dependencies. In 99% of the cases, you don't know if the code is clean. You don't need to worry about class four, so dependency four. You just can ignore them. 
But everyone should know by today, unit test is not the solution for everything. How about that one? The unit is working, so, but just one person at the time. <laughs> and how about that one? Probably some of you might know that already. Come on, how's that? <laughs> How should that work? <laughs> so we need something more. So and 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 the animation is saying already we need integration tests. So the anti integration test is saying it already we should test the integration of the dependency to another dependency. So in this case we want to test the dependency between class 1 and class 2. So easy way we mock it we mock the rest away, but we still can use the unit. And we have a rule set up for us. We, when we started that project, we said we want to have 100% code coverage. And we, nearly everyone we talked to in the first place said, ah, don't even dream of that. But that's how we managed. We managed, we make sure with unit tests that each unit is properly tested and has 100% code coverage the unit itself, but there are cases where you just can't use it, where you can, can't use unit tests, for example, when you have factories, where you have just, where you really put your dependencies together. And that's our small level here, we are getting there into integration tests. So all of these 100% we make sure just with everything in unit test and slightly a bit in integration test. And we really make sure that this is not someone just saying, okay, I don't want to write a unit test, I just do an integration test and get the coverage. That's not allowed for us. But there is still, left, still space left. And space is left for acceptance tests. A lot of you know them. Um, acceptance tests, we can do them on both ways. We, we are doing them on both ways as well. Like first way is doing it real with code. So we take in whole all our four dependencies and test them together. And what we do as well is doing um, Selenium tests and all this stuff um, to make sure that it's really clickable and JavaScript and all, this, all these features are working. I have to say we have still some downsides. We are not there, we are not 100% perfect there as well because in my opinion we don't have enough integration tests between backend and frontend because backend has proper tests, frontend is nearly there already. They're trying to catch up with us at the moment, but we have n no real tests which are making sure that the objects we are handing out to the front end is actually working with the JavaScript. And that's the only places where it's usual. When there is a fuck up on the website, it's usual there. Because there, this is the part which is not covered. So that's pretty much testing everything. So, but still we have that, this is all done before we deploy. Mm -hmm. So we said there, we need there more. We, you saw our architecture. If a page is not shipped by the new system, it will be shipped by the old system. And the old system, we don't want to, sh to sh the old system to ship pages, to ship pages which should be in the new system. So we said, come on, we need more stuff. We need something more in this pyramid up there. So what could that be? And the talk is saying it already, it's smoke tests. Here, small disclaimer again, the solution we have for smoke tests is the solution we found and we used for the time being at, uh, uh, when we had that problem. I learned in the meanwhile that there are tools which are, can easily handle that, which are easily can, where you can easily run stuff, run smoke tests, um, or even sieges or whatever. Um, but what I will show you now is pretty much like the way we did it. So what are smoke tests? Original smoke tests is not coming from IT as usual. Original smoke tests is coming from testing drains and sewage systems and all this stuff. So the idea is to just close all the normal endpoints and just put smoke in there and see where the smoke comes out again. If the smoke is coming out, there is a problem. So 
we said, okay, come on, let's do something. Let's do something similar. So we said before we uh, or during the deployment, before we actually tell our system that this is ready to go live, we run the smoke tests. We really run. We really try all our endpoints and see if something starts to smoke. If there is smoke coming up, we have to look at that point, if that is a big problem, or if that just if it might be just a DNS hiccup or something like that. So that's pretty much our list of defini uh, our, our defined list, what we wanted to have. And we said it should be simple. We should cover all URLs in Google Index because you, uh, what we saw during this as well, uh, during writing the code, that sometimes in the uh, in the product management department, the girls changing some URLs but forget to set up the redirects. So broken URLs in, in Google Index, and it's usually ending up on our plate that there is a product missing, which should not be missing. Um, yeah, and what we said, what we found as well is um, the list with the optional parameters. So Please smoke test not just the regular URL, but I mean, test some at least some URLs, or if you want all URLs with the necessary parameters on it, because only then you will know if that parameter might cause some some trouble. So, how do they work? They work in an easy way. So you have a production server, which is running your application. You have a CI server where you want to run your smoke tests from, and then you send a request and you get it back, and now you can validate on the response, like if the header is okay, if time to first byte is okay, and if there is a body. If you want to do this, make sure your CI server and your production server is actually in the same network. If you, especially if you want to handle the temp to first byte. If they are not in the same network, if, in a diff if, you, if it's just a different data center, it will fuck up your, your time to first byte. What you can test there as well is like when it's slow, it's failing, when it's above your limit, so it, then you can see that. So I said it already, smoke tests should validate status code time to first byte, if a body is provided, and what we are testing as well, if it's the correct server. So we want to make sure that actually the, the correct server is shipping this page, because we smoke test not just the, the new URLs, but we smoke test as well existing URLs from the, from the legacy system. And therefore, we want to test if it's the correct server we expect there. But what you should not try to do with smoke tests is actually doing acceptance tests, like trying to find their diffs and all this stuff. Um, because therefore, are better systems like Selenium, as mentioned before. So in the first place, we wrote some code. And that's how it looked. So we have there, like based on PHP unit. Um, so we said we have their data provider. This provides us for each test pretty much the list of URLs. Um, and each URL, we just send a GET request and yeah, just run the asserts against it. So <laughs> when, we was, when we were finished with that piece of code, it was written in five minutes, 10 minutes, um, we were running it, so it took 45 to 50 minutes. Because we are smoke testing, as I said, we are smoke testing nearly all URLs we have. Probably we are currently not up to date to all URLs. Um, but it's about 20,000 URLs. So it takes 45 to 50 minutes to run them. So we were getting back to the boards, getting back to the papers. So what can we do? How can we speed that up? And then we said, yeah, let's do concurrency. So let's do concurrent smoke tests. Let's, let's send not one request, but let's send three, because it's a real server. So with a real server, it must be able to handle more than one request at the same time. So we said, okay, come on, we, let's try it with, in this case, three. Let's try it with three requests. We send the three requests. At some stage, the first request comes back. 
we directly send a new one because that pipe that pipe here is getting free so we send the next request then another request comes back okay we will send the next one and at the end oh there is one request which is not coming back properly that's red but it comes back so we know it but then we tried to increase the number the number how many threads how many pipes we can run at the same time how how big can the concurrent number b and we got scared that something like that happens to our storage so we don't want to have that <laughs> so with testing all of that we tested it carefully um we came up with a number which worked quite well for us is actually take the number of cores your system has subtract one for the linux on it and fire on everything else they have this is what your server should be able to handle if not Maybe look in your code. Maybe there is something hidden in your code. So that's how it looks for us now. As you can see, we have their continuous deployment on our system. So, and you can easily see here that here got something slow because we see here throughputs, how many requests we can put through within one minute. And each of these is a full set of 20,000 URLs. And you see here, it got kind of slow already during this deployment, and it got even slower here. And then, okay, uh, here we have to do something. So we fixed the problem, and it went back up. So that's how it worked out, and that's how it looks. And we are still, we with the with the rule of having one core uh, using one core less than in the in the hardware exists. Um, we never got in trouble with our, uh, our data center because we are not hosting ourselves. We don't have an own data center or stuff like that. We have a hoster taking care of our hardware. They never complained that we run out of limit on, on some stuff of that one. What is usual getting more into trouble is if we try to run that on some stage environments where everything is on one server. That's usually more tricky. But you don't have to write the code I just showed you yourself. The good part is, just for that, for this conference here, I sit down like weeks, and thanks to Steffi, she took care that I have the time to write that. There is a library for that already. And I really wrote it down, really made it available. So it's even four star already. Um, I try to keep up the numbers as high as possible. Um, so you can use that and feel free to improve it, feel free to get there more features in it. But I would love to explain now how it works. It works in an easy way. We have again PHP unit because that turned out to be the best system uh, to run these tests, to run everything. So you might know that, as I said already, there is um, the test itself, the, the only test, um, and a data provider, that you can use the data provider. What got a bit in our way is that the data provider is actually running in front of all tests. So if you use this library inside your normal test library and you want to run all the whole permit, uh, the data provider is run first. And even if you want, if, and even if you expect the unit tests to run first before any test is running, data providers are sorted. So now PHP units is doing the call to the data provider at the, far, at, at the first step. The data provider is now taking care of sending all the requests. So, and sending that with the, con with the proper concurrency you have set up. And the data provider gets the response, gets the responses, takes care, re creates result objects for you. And then we hand every single result into an own test, which makes it easy which makes it easy and clean to read. So that sounds quite complicated. With the help of a consulting company called the PHPCC, we looked into the code and we wanted to make it as clean as possible, as easy to, to read and as easy to understand as possible. So we said, uh, we said there is only one thing you sh need to do, and that's actually to introduce your, our trade here. So and this trade is just making sure for you that you have features. So let's go through the code. So we start, that's pretty much your entrance. Your entry point, you can start here with a list of URLs. 
in different if it's a list or if you have a CSV file or um, you can attach their databases, whatever you want. And then you put it into, into the URL collection there. You define there the options. So the options um, like request timeout, this is not the timeout the page should give you, but that's the timeout curl you get because the, or the, any system which is behind there. We are using curl in this library for the moment, but it's built like you have the opportunity to uh, use wget or whichever system you prefer there. Um, then what is for some requests important when you want to test, for example, against redirects, if you, uh, to explicitly test if there is a redirect working, um, you can set it up as yes or no. The concurrency, we set it here to three again, like, like an example, and the body length. And for the body length, I have to explain, I said earlier, don't check what is in the body. This body length here is just to save your memory. Because if we would save your whole body into your into the result object and do this for twenty thousand pages, you can count yourself if it one if it's if the body is one megabyte of HTML, for example, then it's five hundred megabytes. You don't want to have that in your memory. So that's why we limit this to five hundred characters, actually. Um, and these five hundred characters are only there for first testing if there is a body. And the second test you can, uh, what the second reason is there, if something is failing, we will show you the, um, the, what was this 500 characters. So if there is a PHP error or something at the, at the beginning of the HTML, um, or at the beginning of the body, then you can see it. So then you can see, for example, that you missed a parameter or whatever. That's what the body length uh, is for. And um, there's one parameter, not here in this example, but it exists. So if you have your system to test behind the basic out, there's, all, there's as well a basic out class you can hand in here as well, um, where you can put in your username and password and test it against the basic out system. Good, then as I said, the result object is coming back. Um, there, yeah, the result object is coming back, and um, with the result object, you have in there, for example, the ready-to-go features. So you have in there the URL again, you have in there um, the time to first byte, you will find headers, you will find bodies, status code, um, a string method, which is giving you that error message, so what, what we use for the error message, uh, like explained, and um, some more small features like is validate. If, if it is a validate result. The last but not least, we have in here um, already some prepared asserts, like if it's a success, um, so we got a 200, error, uh, 200 status code um, that we test against time to first byte, that the body should not be empty, and um, that a specific header is there. So to test that it, the page was shipped by Fury, we set up uh, by our Fury system, we set up on the server that this server is every time sending, this Nginx is sending their, um, the app server Fury, um, and then now we can test against it. We can see if it's there or not. Oh, and I forgot one feature. There's one more feature in this trade. There are two methods called uh, success output and error output, because what you can imagine when you won't see this one while the data provider is running. While the data provider collects and runs all these tests, you don't see anything. So we said we put in there some more features, um, like having in the trade two methods, success and error output, um, which you can override to, to create your own like view. We have in our live uh, environment, we have in here account popping up. Um, like it's counting every, I think every 50 entries, we show the number that to see if the script is actually still working or, or if it, if it run into an endless loop or just died or what's the stake there. So, but in this test case, we run 223 um, tests. One of them failed. So it was a 404 by purpose to show here something. And that's how it, that's how it's, 
it's outputting. So in the, in this case, it tells us, okay, there there was no success. That's and uh, and that's the header and body and all this information you have there. There are a few more features to come, which are already in the pipeline. So you might have heard there's already PHP Unit 6. So to get on that one a bit more, um, the library at the moment is based on PHP 5 and PHP Unit 6 by purpose, um, because we want to enable teams with this system, with this library, to smoke test their existing legacy system and create their new one while they still test it. So, the, so there might be teams out there which don't have yet um, a PHP 7 environment, so they can easily run that on a bit more legacy systems. But there will be soon another a second version, a complete second branch, uh, where, where we want to put up that in PHP Unit 6 um, and improve there the usual quality, more assertions, um, redirects, all the stuff, what we want to do there. Good, but now how is this fitting into our architecture? So because you can imagine if we run that against the live system during a peak time, that might still cause some trouble. But that's what where our server architecture comes in into the game and it tells us a few more things. So we have their current setup, it's an AB setup. So we have two identical servers. We don't, in, uh, at Kartmacherei, we don't worry about hot standbys and failovers and all this stuff. This is all the data center doing for us. So from our view, we just take care of server A and B. And we have the web server service in front of that, which is not doing much, except just this web service knows how every request goes to server A now, or every request goes to server B. So if so only one server is live at the time, so the other one is, is idling. The other one is doing nothing. So now we want to deploy there something. So we have that deactivated server. Uh, a server B is currently doing every request, so we don't need to worry on server A that there's users on it or anything else. So the idea is, so we deploy the code. Then, as mentioned before, we run we collect an export script. And before all this happened, we, we run already the unit integration and acceptance tests on it. And now, after collecting export, after everything looks good to us, now we run the smoke tests. But what we are not doing is actually running the smoke tests against the web server directly. Because for us, that caused some trouble. Because when we access this server directly, who's making sure that this connection is working? So we copied one-to-one -one our configuration on that server and gave that server a second name to listen on. So we can access either the whole system via our normal URL, which will end up on, on the active server, or we have in here, a hidden configuration which is 99.9% the same as the other configuration, except the one place where the host name is mentioned. Just to go to have this tweak to go through the system here to go directly to the server. With the smoke tests, as I said, we reach all the endpoints, everything works, but if not, we won't you see there is something left here. We won't go there. We won't, we just stop. There is an email sent to a lot of people that there is something failed and at least one of them has to look and has to double check what is broken there. And then we rerun the whole deployment if necessary or sometimes it happens that the DNS lookup um, caused some trouble, um, at, especially at the beginning because we had, didn't have the DNS lookup cache active. Um, and then we rerun just the tests in these cases, and then we go to the next step, and the last step, and that's switching on the system. So we have their currently active server B. We just put in place server A, tell this web service just to reload, so every request which got already queued is still going to the old system. Every request which is 
from then moment on coming in is going to the new system. And that's pretty much, we are pretty much sorted already. Just a conclusion, please do me a favor and write tests. Please do yourself the favor, try to get to 100%. It's hard to get there, but you will love it when you are, when you are there because 100% is a good number and 100% really makes sure that you don't have any loopholes in there. It's not saying that there are no bugs in the system, but it gives the freedom to refactor code. It gives the freedom to write clean code. And getting 100% is forcing you in a lot of places to write clean code. As I said before, smoke test your website um, and only activate the server if it's working, if everything is fine. And then I'm already done. I already would love to say thank you. And now I'm open for questions. Hey. Hi. Sorry. Um, <laughs> hi. I know you've already got two servers that you're paying for, so I was wondering, is there a reason not to do it on staging and then just deploy once those are passed because, and make staging bigger? Yeah, I get your point. Um, we are actually currently not doing it on stage at all, because, uh, but that's due to a database issue because our database between stage and live is not equal. So we can't run the same list of URLs against um, the live and the stage system. Um, and, I, and that's, in my opinion, the biggest point. You can still run it against your stage system, but is it still showing you that not the hardware failed or uh, your Redis uh, went down without noticing or got stuck? That's more the problem. That's why we said we want to run that actually against the live environment, um, because only then we can be 100% certain that these pages we have there listed actually work and actually will be available for the customers. More questions? You were saying that you would probably do things differently now. What sort of things might you do differently now? Yeah, as I showed you um, in in the slides already with the library, we just introduced, uh, we, when, while I was writing that library for this conference here, um, I realized that we are not doing proper concurrent smoke testing. Um, and with this pro uh, proper concurrent smoke test, because we, in, to explain it a different, in the way we did it before, we just did concurrency, but we sent it a chunk of 10 requests and waited at all at the same time and waited until the last one came back. So we ended up like with, the, with 20,000 URLs at something like eight minutes, which felt kind of okay. But now with the library, I tested it. I have expected more, actually, from, from the library, which is proper doing uh, or doing proper concurrent testing. Um, but I, we only gained something like a minute on 20,000 URLs. So I expected much more to get out there. But if all pages are near to 100 milliseconds, they are all coming back literally at the same time. Questions already? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, you said uh, like uh, you know for normal case you I mean you, you just gave the UK use case saying you know the CO is going where you pass the smoke and look for where the smoke is coming from the other side right do you have any better use case in terms of code uh, where we need to close all the in, in points and you know check where the smoke is coming yeah as I said this if, if I get your question correct um, the smoke tests, when we see their smoke, we have to look on, on each single case. What If it's just a DNS lookup, as I mentioned before, that's, it's the usual case we had in the last months. Um, but now we have more uh, often the problem that there is a redirect missing, um, which someone forgot to set up. Um, and we never really had their bigger issues that a page send us a 500 or a 404. This more, the system, every of the other tests, in so the whole pyramid in, in total is making sure that the system is working. So since we have that whole pyramid in place, yes, we still have bugs. Yes, 
not everything is perfect, but with the pyramid in place, we see much, much earlier, not on the deployments anymore, uh, when something is failing. So, and we had at, at the far beginning when we introduced the pyramid, we had there some trouble with um, um, that the database was not consistent. That we, for example, when we built that system and we have there quite a strict rule what a format uh, from, a, from a technical perspective should look like and the format name should look like. So for us, it's as an example, F040 is a small square card. Um, so we set up the rule for it, but we tested it against our development environment. We tested it even against our stage environment. But as soon as we wanted to go live, there was more than just F40. So there was more formats, which we and kind of formats existing. Um, and it's not just starting with an F. For example, for envelopes, it's EF. We never thought about that. And that's usual, like the fuck up we, we had at the beginning with the tests um, to make sure that this, uh, this is helping us a lot. Because otherwise, we might not have seen it if we wouldn't have run the whole pyramid. Question answered? OK, thank you very much. There's one in the back. You said you tested about 25,000 URLs. Yeah. Uh, how did you go about getting the entire list of URLs on your site? Yeah, OK, that, thank you. Thank you. I completely forgot about that topic. Um, it's, uh, our list of URLs is actually not dynamic. So we tried it. We thought about doing it dynamic. But we ended up finding far too many reasons why the dynamic solution is not good. Because if you create that list dynamic on the stuff you just exported, if you export is just doing not 20,000 URLs, but just two, it still would, would work. It still would run to smoke tests, work, so, sorted. So we said, and I really would recommend that, either take an own system to maintain the URLs, or as we did it, we just have a CSV, we have two CSV files, one for the new system, one for the old system. So for pretty much for each smoke test category, we have an own CSV file, which is uh, holding all the URLs. But to get these URLs, there are two ways. Either you look in the index of Google and make sure that you get them. Or what we did, we, uh, when we were sure to cover all the pages manually, um, we just took our Redis and exported the list of available URLs into a file. And since then, it's manual. So if there is a URL which is really a 404, which is really has to be taken out, there is really a, a deployment for us necessary to take this URL out to make the system work again. But that's the only way we figured, which is making sure that your system stays stable. Because you have to double check that if there is a 404 on a, on a Google index, you don't want to have that. There should be a proper redirect to the correct page. Only we, we removed some 404 pages uh, uh, recent, just recently because they weren't in the index at all, in the Google index at all, and there was never content on it. So someone created category pages without putting products on it. So we took them out as well. That's answering your question. One here at the front. You provide us with a couple of examples in which uh, you actually uh, detected an actual issue with this smoke test and what kind of issues they were, for example. As I said before, usual, the usual issue what we detect with the smoke test is um, we had once or twice that the Redis are doing, we, because we are pushing with much, as much power as we have into the Redis. So when the collect and export is running, um, we clean the Redis completely, we strip it empty and then refill it as fast as we can. And once in a while we had that that on the server it just stopped and we didn't see it. We didn't see it during the deployment, so pretty much the last, re the last push into Redis um, somehow killed it. So we couldn't access it anymore. So And that's what, what showed us the, the smoke test, because when we tried to access the page, um, the Fury system answered 404. Sorry, I don't know that system because I have there an issue in Redis, or Redis just didn't get it. Um, and uh, redirect, and, and then the redirect to the old system happened, and the old system answered. That's why I said we we want to test the headers. So I tested the header against the system uh, to make sure that this system, the, the correct system, is answering. Um, 
and therefore we saw that Redis, for example, uh, went down. Or um, we see usual issues, as I showed you before in the, in the graph, um, we see when the page slows down. So because we um, some, get, don't count me on days, uh, maybe two months ago, um, someone introduced the front end feature, uh, wanted to put something from, from our new team members, wanted to put a nice feature, like putting the name when the customer is logged in, put the name at the top. So that's your name. And he used Twig for it. So we don't have Twig rendering in the front end. So now on each request, we would have to fire up Twig. So we love Twig, we have Twig in the back end, but we don't want to have it in the front end for us because it's, yeah, loading it up, it's not necessary for us. So we said, okay, if you want to do that, don't do it with Twig, just do it with XPath. So because everything we have to tweak still in the front end, which comes out of Redis for actually showing like customer login status and all this stuff, um, is done with XPath and filtering. And that's what it what showed up as well, because the time to first byte went fr down from our 100 milliseconds, or yeah, we, yeah, from down from 100 milliseconds to something like 200. So a lot of pages st started to fail and the smoke tests got really slow. And you can easily see that because we are running that deployment really on a pipeline and our whole pipeline takes long, usually something like 15 to 20 minutes. When it takes more than 25 minutes, then it's, it's usual the smoke tests uh, and then you have to look into it. Good, more questions? There's one at the back. Just. Uh, hi. Um, if I understand correctly, this only does GET requests at the moment? Yeah, is you're doing only that, uh, based that on GET requests. So would you not recommend doing POST requests, for example? The problem or our solution for that is easy. We don't have GET requests in the new system. So it's not, uh, it's not meant to be for POST requests yet. There is ideas to put them in there in the future as soon as we come to that point because post requests is based on the legacy system and we said we will introduce everything just for the for the new system to narrow our focus so we don't have to think about everything left and right we only narrow our focus on the on the top, topic and tasks in front of us there will be in the future features um, available to have their post requests as well thank you good okay <laughs> good more questions Okay, then, thanks again, <laughs> and have a great day.